Welcome to Let's Talk Micro. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. As always, I hope you had a great week. And you can always find Let's Talk Micro on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Good Pods. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find Let's Talk Micro. As for our social media, I am on Instagram as Let's Talk Micro, no apostrophe, on Twitter as Let's Talk Micro 1, on LinkedIn as Luis Plaza, TikTok and YouTube as Let's Talk Micro. So please go ahead and subscribe to the podcast, leave a review if the app allows you to do so, and definitely continue downloading episodes. And if you have any suggestions, any feedback, you can always email those at letstalkmicro at outlook.com. But as always, thank you for the support. And I am very excited because, you know, uh, Micro 2023, is approaching quickly from the American Society for Microbiology. This is the first time that I'm going to be attending. I wanted to do this for years, but it has, you know, it never worked out. So it finally did this year. So I'm very excited. So hopefully, you know, if you recognize me, if you see me there, just, you know, say hi. I'm going to try to see if I can record an episode while I'm there, but I will definitely let you let you know. But definitely, you know, if you see me, if you recognize me, you know, stop me and, you know, and talk to me. And definitely, I'm looking forward to meeting you, whether you're a listener or a guest. So, if you haven't listened to the previous episode of Let's Talk Micro, that was part one of a two-part episode regarding when a network system from a hospital goes down. So, last week, the first part with Dr. Christina Wujiwura aired. So, it was released. And she, you know, she's from the uh, University of Vermont Medical Center. She's the director of clinical microbiology there. And she, you know, she tells her story about, you know, her hospital network going down and how this affected the hospital. But we focus, you know, since I'm a medical laboratory scientist and she works in the lab. So she focused on the aspect from the laboratory's point of view. So she started talking about you know, what happened, when did they notice something was wrong, and what, you know, what plan they came up with. So on today's episode is the conclusion of this. So what they continue doing, when the issue was resolved, what happened, and she offers advice on, on what to do when you experience situations like this. Because, you know, like I mentioned before, this is something that could happen to any of the hospitals, to, you know, to any hospital. So we need to be prepared, have some sort of plan. Technology is wonderful. It definitely, you know, it helps us a lot. But when it goes down, you know, what do we do? So we need to be prepared for situations like this. So part one was great. If you haven't checked it out, go ahead and do so. And then once you do that, come back and listen to the conclusion. So part two with Dr. Christina Wujigura. Let's go ahead and listen to it. And then you also mentioned, right, so you, you had some forms that had QR codes, right? So can you talk about those? Sure. So this is something that um, our CLIA director and our chemistry director thought up, which I just thought was brilliant. So um, we quickly figured out that there were no reference ranges um, on our um, results, especially, you know, that's not as big of a deal in microbiology because the reference range usually is negative, but um, for things like chemistry, the instrument printouts didn't have the reference range on it. And so we we started out by first putting a QR code um, on, on signs that we could paste up around the hospital um, that took providers to the um, our, our test catalog, which I don't know about you, but Nobody ever find, nobody ever goes to look at our test catalog. So we, we kind of directed them there um, so that they could know what samples to collect, um, what the reference ranges were, um, those kinds of things. Um, we also um, made a QR code that talked about routine turnaround times now, because this is new normal. We're not gonna be able to live up to our turnaround times um, uh, that we had in the past. And we were getting calls relatively frequently about um, negative blood cultures. Is the blood culture still negative? <laughs> we were like, 
we got this. <laughs> if it's positive, we'll let you know. Um, and so, you know, just alerting them to that fact. Um, and then um, some results like um, EGFR, for example, those are calculations that were are always done in the system. Now the providers had values. And so the QR codes um, would could walk them through that calculation piece. Um, so it helped push out information um, to the clinical teams from the laboratory, uh, from, from trusted references so that they weren't trying to figure it out on their own. You know, as you're talking about this, and I, I, I keep thinking about the handwritten results, and I can think about like in microbiology, you know, sometimes, you know, I think we had one day where things from like the Vitek were in crossing over, and that was like a very long day. So, so I can't imagine that just going one by one and then, you know, transcribing all those results. Oh, yeah, definitely. You need as many people as you can get for that. Once again, you know, going through the timeline. So what about day 22? And then, yes, 22. Day 22. <laughs> So day 22, um, we, would, uh, we were told that we would be back online in three days. Um, and so um, we decided what started on paper stayed on paper. It was going to be too hard to back enter everything. Um, at that point, we were able to get Epic read-only access. And so um, we at least could... Um, find some patients, figure out some patient history, um, which we didn't have before. Um, I don't know about uh, where you work, but, um, you know, we're pretty used to doing rounds on microbiology twice a day where we look at what's growing. We take a look at patient history. We decide on, uh, you know, what, how to report certain things that all went, had to go away during downtime. We just reported everything we had um, because we, we couldn't make a clinical judgment at that point. Um, so we started getting a little bit of, of information back. Um, and at this point, thankfully, our CLIA director um, was very involved in the, um, the cutover plan and how we were gonna start back up. Because um, it's not just flipping a switch. Um, and so um, they, they were working on that for a while. Um, they, um, not everything started up at the same time. Um, so some of our blood bank um, modules, uh, we use a separate blood bank module that was not up and running. Um, and the, the big oops on our part was we didn't realize that all of our interfaces, um, such as to the state health department, weren't up and running. And so um, if you look back at the COVID data in November of 2020, um, we've got a little false outbreak um, because we thought we were reporting all of the results through the interface, um, but they weren't going, any, going anywhere. So we had to retrospectively um, report all of our COVID results to our um, state health department um, uh, a few weeks later. Um, so, so things came back up slowly, um, uh, but it, it felt okay. The, the areas where it was the most cumbersome were areas like mycobacteriology, where, um, oops, um, where you um, have samples, culture results that go for, you know, eight weeks. Well, so eight weeks you're working in parallel worlds. You have both paper and you have electronic systems. Um, and so that, that was difficult um, to navigate for a while. Wow, and uh, what's the, so, and you also, you know, you mentioned some limbo cases. So what are those? Yes, um, so those were, um, are kind of, um, they started, pre or post, um, they, they, they happened right on the shoulders of, of the downtime. And so um, uh, those were cases that really got lost in the shuffle, um, especially reflex testing. So HPV on positive PAPs. Um, so the PAP result went out, but the HPV result never, never got reported. 
for a lot of those, we could um, still salvage the, uh, the sample. It was still good, um, still viable. Um, but for some of them, we, we weren't able to. Um, and so those we had to, to send um, for recollection. And then we also had to tell providers that, um, you know, if you're still looking for a result on your patient and you don't have it at this point, we can't provide it for you and you're, you're gonna have to recollect. Um, thankfully, all of our anatomic pathology cases, um, uh, all of those were accounted for. Um, so uh, it, it was more blood and urine type samples, um, but um, those, those were the ones we had to send out um, a note to providers saying that we just can't, we don't have a result for this. Um, you're gonna have to recollect. Yeah, I see that. And, you know, like sometimes even even if it's not like an order that has a reflex, you know, the they order, like, for example, they just ordered a regular urinalysis and then they realize after the fact, oh, you know, let me order the culture. And sometimes, you know, if, it's, you, don't, if you don't have someone that's monitoring those orders and you don't have a system, then those will definitely not get performed. And then by the time someone realized the sample has been discarded and so it's like, you know, yeah, if you, if you need it in this case, then, you know, we ask for a recollect. Yeah, we, um, we, early on, we had to let people know that there were, there was no add-on testing because we, we could, we had no good way of knowing where the sample was, was filed essentially. Um, in our current system, we have tube storage and we, we can look exactly where, where to find the sample. Um, we just didn't have the bandwidth to go hunting for samples for add-ons. Um, so yeah, they, they had to get a new sample if they wanted something additional. Yeah, that's true. Cause you know, you typically check, okay, who, you know, where is it at? Like, you know, we do in our lab sometimes, you know, who finalized it, where did it go? And yeah, it's definitely very time consuming. You're not gonna be able to sift through all and then for every request, it's just, yeah, it's not realistic. So I can definitely see that. So when, when was the system fully online? So uh, day um, day 25, um, we were back. Um, and day 30 to day 60, we, we went and tried to do as deep of a risk assessment as we could. Um, so uh, we went back, looked at any patient complaints, provider complaints, um, looking to see, that's where we discovered the HPV um, not reflexing issue. Um, so it, it took us about two months to kind of work through all of that um, and make sure that, you know, as far as we can tell, we did the best we could um, uh, with, with all of the patient samples that we had. Okay. And uh, so what were the lessons learned from this? So many. Um, so um as much as you possibly can, you need to stop samples coming into the laboratory because once they're in the laboratory, they're your problem. And so contacting um, all of the providers and um, groups that you work with, asking them to send things to other reference laboratories, um, if you can di divert them, if you're in a system, we were able for, this is a micro talk, but for our anatomic pathology, um, we were able to relocate some of our anatomic pathologists and samples down to um, a hospital that in our network that still had connectivity. Um, so that's an option. Um, shutting down phlebotomy sites, um, asking providers to only order things if it's absolutely necessary for urgent patient care, anything you can do um, to decrease the samples coming in, because um, that, that lowers your risk uh, of anything going wrong. Um, thinking about how you're going to communicate within your laboratory, within the hospital system, um, how are you going to get results out to providers? Um, so making sure that you have um, uh, an up-to-date um, Rolodex or, or listing of providers and phone numbers and ordering locations because you'll get all combinations of those. Um, so, so being able to communicate results back um, is super important. You know, I'm not super aware of all of the billing implications. I know that we lost a lot of money during, during this, um, but if the plan is to um, bill for any of any of the testing that's performed, um, thinking ahead of time about what 
what information is going to be needed, you know, um, making sure you have appropriate um, ICD-10 codes, all of that kind of stuff. Um, again, the, the bouncer worked really well for us. And, and so um, putting in some barrier between the laboratory and others is important. And same thing with um, routing all of the phones out of the lab to a central calling system um, to make sure that that the lab staff can really focus on, on their work. Um, again, because they're handwriting, they're handwriting patient names on plates and dates of birth, um, uh, making sure that all of that is legible for the next tech who works up that culture is super important. You're gonna have to get all of the fax machines you can possibly get your hands on and um, repurpose staff that aren't able to do their their routine jobs to fax those results out and file um, all of the results afterwards and then be able to pull those results and fax them again when somebody else calls for them. Um, we were lucky that our document control system um, was external to our hospital system. So our document control system is Media Lab. Again, I'm not promoting Media Lab, but it was very nice because it was um, just on the web. And so we could access that from um, either computers on the guest network for the hospital or on our phones. Um, so that way things weren't, things were accessible. Um, and then you're gonna need to hardwire printers. Um, you're gonna have to have encrypted USB drives. That's how we were able to get our COVID results to the state health department um, uh, over time, rather than faxing all of them. We just sent USB drives back and forth. Um, and eventually we figured out having a label printer um, in the micro lab, because if you can think of you know, your anaerobic culture, at least for us, that's six plates plus a thio plus slides and the handwriting, all of that um, gets pretty old. So um, we set up a label printer um, so that at least, at least it was legible. It probably took about the same amount of time, but uh, that way people's hands didn't cramp up and just be flexible. You will, things will change 8 million times throughout the process, um, but everybody's got good ideas and just take them, try them. Um, trying to think about this ahead of time before it happens. Um, we didn't have ways to document our culture workups ahead of time. So um, think about how you would wanna do that in a paper world, um, build forms, pass them around, show them around to your friends um, and see if there's ways to improve them. And then you have them on the shelf to just make photocopies of when you need them so that you're not trying to do that all in real time. Yeah, you know, like if we think, think about it we definitely not use that much paper anymore for right and, and are, you know handwrite stuff so yeah and all these little things you know that we don't think about and then when that happens you start thinking about like you say you know reference ranges and all this stuff so yeah definitely we're so used to all that being on the computers so we perform our testing a lot of the instruments you know uh, they they cross over and then we just accept and some of them even auto file so definitely you know technology technology plays a huge role um, so these were, you know, lessons and they're also applied to advice for the audience. Is there anything else that you can advise them? My biggest piece of advice is reach out for help. Unfortunately, there's a growing network now of laboratories that have gone through this. Um, and I can at least speak for my laboratory, but I'm more than willing to to offer advice, to to chat with anybody that um, happens to find themselves in this situation um, because there are things you just don't think of until you're in it. Um, and while I know it's a CAP checklist requirement and I, I know that everybody um, aims to have a downtime procedure that's all encompassing, I, I just don't think you can plan for this um, uh, for every little iteration. And so, um, Please reach out, find find others who have gone through this, um, get different ideas, um, and just <laughs> lean on people for help. Because when you're in it, you feel very isolated. Um, and and there are others that have gone through this. Um, and uh, I think our community is is pretty willing to help. Yes, definitely. Um, so, is is there anything else that you want to? Uh, anything else that you have to add? 
I don't think so. It was a wild ride. It definitely, you know, sounds like it. You know, you were talking about the downtown procedures and, you know, that we do. And realistically, since most people maybe don't experience it, and you know, like I mentioned, sometimes you have some very short ones, and sometimes, you know, it happens on night shifts. So whoever works during the days. So some people might have gone through many years of work and never experienced one. So definitely might not even be familiar with the procedure. Where are this, where is this stuff? So, you know, you get also part-time employees, you have per diem. So all that adds to the mix where you find yourself in this situation. It's like, okay, what do we do? So, you know, maybe hopefully you have someone there that's familiar with it, but that's a big challenge. Well, you know, this has been great. And, you know, shout out to you and your team because in regular times, you know, this will be very tough. And then you add that all the challenges that COVID presented, you know, lack of supplies, you're overworked, a huge amount of testing, you know, you're working with a mask, the uncertainty of what's going to happen. Are you going to catch it? Are you not? So a lot of rapid changes. So that definitely was, those were very difficult times and you had this. So definitely, you know, shout out to you and your team. Well, thank you. I, I would not have made it through without my staff. They were amazing. And everybody pitched in. I, I think, you know, through COVID, something like this, you, your team gets closer together and everybody, everybody pulls through um, to make sure that we're doing the best we can for patient care. Exactly. So yes, definitely, you know, teamwork is very essential and regular times and in down times, it's just, you know, the end goal is to do the best that we can for the patients and produce the best results and so they can be treated properly. So Definitely your team show displayed, you know, a great, a huge amount of teamwork. Definitely. Well, you know, uh, Dr. Wujiwara, it's, you know, it's been great listening to this. Like I said to the audience, you know, I listened to it before, but it's just, once again, it was so engaging. So thank you for taking the time to come in into Let's Talk Micro. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And that, my dear audience, it's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed listening to this story about what, what happens when a network goes down. You know, this is very important because this could happen to any of us working in, the, in, in a hospital or in a laboratory. So we need to be prepared. Definitely, you know, we're so used to the system, right? We find samples. We look up results. You know, in micro, it's a big, important part, right? Um, definitely for referencing cultures and doing things like that. So we need to be prepared. So thank you, Dr. Wujiwara, for telling us your story. As always, thank you for the support again. Continue downloading episodes. And I hope to see some of you on ASM Micro. So as always, continue bringing that passion to what you do. It's so important. As you know, we do such great work. So stay motivated, stay safe, and of course, continue talking micro until the next time. Bye.